Okay, it's live now. Mm. Okay, should we begin? Yes. Yes. Or uh, should we just wait for a couple of minutes on my for other people to join in? Okay. Uh, no, you can start. You can start. Okay. Okay. So, <laughs> good morning, everyone, and welcome to this very special edition of our uh, lecture series. Today, we have a very special guest with us, a renowned writer. Gita Hariharan, who has kindly consented to take some time out of a, of a schedule and be with us today. Um, this gives us immense joy and pride to be able to host her. Um, today, we are uh, going to begin by inviting our respected principal, sir, Dr. Gopal Chandra Bera, to deliver a welcome address, welcoming every one of you, and as well as our renowned speaker, Gita Hariharan. To this particular lecture session and handing the microphone over to our principal sir, Dr. Gopal Chandra Sir. Hello. Uh, good morning, everyone. Respected Mrs. Geta Hariharan, eminent writer, fiction, a fiction and visiting professor, India and abroad, distinguished academicians and scholars who have joined us for the, from different parts of India and my dear students. I welcome you all to this special occasion wherein we have rare opportunity of listening to an address to be delivered by one of the most powerful writers India has produced, Geta Hariharan, who talk to talk you today, fighting on diversity, what can you and I do? As principal of this prestigious, prestigious college, I feel proud to share with you some facts of this. 148 years old institution, Minabur College, since its inception in the year 1873, has been inclined on imparting education with values and character. Currently, the college offers honors courses in 22 subjects and PG courses in 14 subjects. Along with this college also offers host of diploma courses and certificate courses in diverse subjects and has become a premier center of higher division, not only in the state of West Bengal, but also across the country at large. As mark of its academic excellence, the college has been conferred with autonomous status by EGC in 2014 and has achieved CP status in two streams. The special heritage status in 2015 is also a vindication to its peerless and commendable academic strength. The college has been reactivated by NAC in third cycle in 2017 and has inclined A plus with 3.60 CGPA, which is the commendable achievement by our college. Needless to say, almost all the departments vie with each other for academic excellence and ensure committed and diligent work to keep the glory of the proud heritage of the college. Seminars, workshops, special lectures are a regular feature of our college of which and today's special lecture is further testimony of that. I extend my sincere thanks to respected Mrs. Vita Hariharan for accepting, accepting our invitation and taking time, taking time to offer VG City to deliver a special address. I hope our participants will be highly benefited by the insights of Mrs. Hariharan and believe that the perspective questions an animated interaction will bring alive what promises to be an engaging lecture on the topic which is very relevant in contemporary India. With all humility I confess, as a man of physics, I may not be most equipped to understand all the nuances of such eminent writers' address, but the title has to be chosen by the Department of English promises to address issues that we hold close to our heart. India has always known for its plurality of faith and diversity of culture. This is our proud and glorious heritage, emboldened by our legendary spiritual and philosophical leaders. But sometimes we feel that such a rich tradition is being questioned and jeopardized by disruptive forces. Therefore, it is necessary to have discourses on the discussion of the subject so that we may critique what is questionable and ratify what to be affirmed. I look forward to this engaging uh, discussions with the journalists. I also once again have, like to thank all of us joining on this academic exercise 
high on behalf of Indian Rural College in general and Department of English in particular. I welcome you once again to this lecture. I have a clear English session of room. Thank you very much. Namaste. Thank you, sir, for your kind and uh, warm welcome address. It's always a pleasure to listen to you. Um, before we formally introduce our speaker to everyone, she needs no introduction, but still, it would be like an honor for us to do so. Um, just one thing I'd like to add, that a number is being scrolled towards the bottom of your screen, a WhatsApp number. We would like you to send your questions to that particular number. And after the lecture is over, um, we are going to send or discuss some of these questions with our speaker. It's a pity that she can't see you face to face, but uh, in this way we can communicate with her. So please try to send your queries, questions, observations to that particular number, WhatsApp number, WhatsApp them. And after the uh, lecture is over, our department, Professor Tanmay Kundu, will select a few of them and um, read it out to Gita uh, Hariharan, and then she has going to respond. Time for us now to formally introduce our speaker. Um, acclaimed by James Kudzie as an outstanding writer, Gita Hariharan was born in Coimbatore, Tamil Nadu in 1954, and she grew up in Bombay and Manila. She got a Bachelor of Arts degree in English Literature and Psychology from Bombay University and a Master of Arts in Communications from the Fairfield University, Connecticut. She worked as a staff writer in WNET Channel 13 in New York, and from 1979 to 1984, she worked as an editor in the Mumbai, Chennai, and New Delhi offices of Colonial Longman, where she was responsible for the social science, fiction, and women's studies lists. From 1985 to 2005, she worked as a freelance professional editor for a range of academic institutions and foundations. She is, at present, a writer based in New Delhi. Nita Haryana's published works include novels, uh, short stories, essays, and newspaper columns, uh, her first novel, The Thousand Faces of Night, won the Commonwealth Writers' Prize for Best First Book in 1993. Her other works include The Coasts of Basu Master, When Dreams Travel, uh, sorry, just a moment, Basu Master, When Dreams Travel, In Times of Sea, Fugitive Histories, and I Have Become the Thai. Hariharan has authored highly acclaimed short stories. The Art of Dying, and a book of stories for children, The Winning Team. Almost Home, Cities and Other Places is a collection of her insightful essays. She has also edited a volume of stories in English translation from four major South Indian languages, a Southern Harvest, who edited a collection of stories for children, Story Best Friend, a collection of essays entitled From India to Palestine, Essays in Solidarity, and co-edited Battling for India, a Citizen's Leader. Harinani's fiction has been translated into a number of languages, including French, Italian, Spanish, German, Dutch, Greek, Urdu, and Vietnamese. Her essays and fiction have also been included in anthologies such as Salman Rushdie's Mirror Work, 50 Years of Indian Writing, 1947 to 1997. She wrote a monthly column for many years on different aspects of culture and their political and social underpinnings in the Telegraph, Kolkata. She has been visiting professor or writer in residence in several universities, including Dartmouth College and George Washington University in the United States, the University of Canterbury at Kent in the UK, Nanyang Technological University in Singapore, and in India, Jamia Millia Islamia and Goa University. Hariharan is one of the founders of the Indian Writers Forum, a platform for cultural politics, and a consulting editor to the forum's Journal of Culture, Tuktagu. Hariharan has, over the years, been a cultural commentator through her essays, lectures, and activism. In 1995, she challenged the Hindu Minority and Guardianship Act as discriminatory against women. The case led to a landmark Supreme Court judgment in 1999 on guardianship. Gita Hariharan's writing is a testimony of how past struggles are played out in the lives of people. Generally categorized as a feminist writer, she accepts the label of the mark of respect and believes that the term has to be used in a rigorous and defined way. She thinks that feminism, like Freudian psychoanalysis and Marxism, is one major current ocean of thought which has influenced the writers in significant ways. 
but feminism, she believes, should not be singled out as a force of resistance. It must form an alliance with other movements of thought, resist identity and politics. Literature can play a significant role in this as it offers one a sharper perception, a worldview which inspires inspire to question conservatism. Her questioning is one salient aspect of her and striking. If in Gwen James' travels she questioned the menace hidden under an age old hill, and in almost home she questioned what it means to be at home, in From India to Palestine she asked, What sort of India do we want? What sort of India do we want? Is it the multiplicitous India that we all have been a proud part of? Or is it something not by jingoism? To answer this, I would now like to invite Gita Hariaran to deliver an address entitled Fighting for Diversity, What Can You and I Do? Now. Thank you so much, all of you. Thank you, Shaikat. Uh, you brought uh, us to exactly the point where I want to begin, um, except that perhaps I would extend that question. Uh, what sort of India do we want uh, to live in? What sort of India do we want to remake and construct? Uh, perhaps in these times, it's appropriate to, to extend that question to what sort of world do we want to live in? Uh, because we are, um, you know, living two parallel lives, both in India and looking at the rest of the world. So to talk about diversity, I think we should begin with the official narrative. Um, this is important to talk about because we find even the somewhat bland official narrative of diversity being challenged today. Leave alone the day-to-day -day experiential uh, diversity that all of us partake of. So official diversity, we start at the place, at the legacy that all of us share, which is the constitution. So by no means perhaps a perfect constitution, but this is the heirloom, the legacy that we have as independent, as an independent nation, as apparently, allegedly free citizens. So we often hear, we often hear people paying lip service to uh, Indian diversity, particularly when talking about culture, which is why it's of so much relevance to all of us, saying the strength of Indian culture is its diversity. Okay, so now what is the official narrative based on the Constitution? I'm just going to read a couple of quotes from the Constitution just to start us off. So we actually have the official taking into account of the diversity of this country. The constitution says, as India is a country of many languages, religions, and cultures in the plural, the constitution provides several measures, special measures in articles 29 and 30 to protect the rights of the minorities. So we have uh, six fundamental rights that every Indian has on the basis of the constitution. The right to equality, the right to freedom, the right against exploitation, the right to freedom of religion, cultural and educational rights, and the right to constitutional remedies. And Article 15 states that no person shall be discriminated on the basis of religion, race, caste, sex, or place of birth. Article 19 guarantees freedom of speech and expression, with, of course, there's always the caveat of the reasonable restrictions. And there's the right to freedom of religion and providing religious freedom to all citizens so as to sustain the principle of secularism. I, we are not, I'm not an academic. I'm not here to discuss uh, uh, some of these uh, concepts uh, whether it's free speech or secularism, in necessarily an academic way, but in a lived way, um, in, in terms of how we see uh, both these principles, the value of these principles, as well as the assault against these principles in day-to-day -day life, in political life, in the classroom, in the courts, on the streets. So I 
am hoping that we are here to talk about diversity and to talk about fighting for diversity today in India in particular, but elsewhere as well. First, as readers and writers, then as teachers and students, and of course, finally, and most importantly, as citizens, because for purposes of discussion, we're pretending these various identities can be broken up. But of course, a writer is a citizen, a reader is a citizen, a teacher is a citizen, and we, a student is a citizen, and we function as such. But I am separating these because we also have, as it were, local venues in terms of text, um, in, in terms of uh, campus activities for students and teachers. So, so that we look at where we must insist on diversity. So to begin with, we have looked at that official narrative. Um, I said in the beginning that the official narrative can be somewhat bland, um, which is your kind of Republic Day parade. You know, those tableau were planned to show this variety, but it was more spectacle. It, uh, if you like, it's not very different from the kind of Amar Akbar Anthony model, which is that people coexist, which is, of course, in these times, seems like a very desirable aim. But really, what we want to do is go further and look at diversity as not just a question of tolerance, that we will tolerate difference, that we will tolerate people who pray differently or do not pray at all, or who eat different things or who speak different languages and so on and so forth or have, um, uh, uh, who live, who, how do we really, the question becomes, how do we not only partake of difference as an advantage, as a source, a resource, but also how do we, having identified difference, having accepted it, how do we include people? How do we include other groups? How do we include in the classroom, in, uh, 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 the, uh, in the parliament, mm, on the streets, and in day-to-day -day life? Uh, I think at the most fundamental level, at the most literal level, we're talking in times where we are talking about the importance of social distancing. And um, in a way, it becomes all the more important to talk about inclusion, about solidarity, because physical distancing is precisely how one of our oldest fault lines um, has been experienced on the ground, which is a kind of, um, uh, uh, you know, cartographical discrimination that because of caste, that different people live in uh, different parts of the village. Let me, I want now and then to refer to some literary texts. Let me here refer to an important autobiography by a Tamil Dalit writer called Bama. Her biography, autobiography, sorry, is called Karak, which is the serrated edge of the palm leaf. And she uses it to say that not only does society cut people of a lower caste, but her aim is also to cut through these forms of discrimination. That is, that is the uh, rationale behind the title. Now there she describes the village um, as a member of the Parayar community in Tamil Nadu. She describes what it was like growing up where she really thought the village ended at the end of their street. And all the important institutions, whether it was a school or the post office, um, all the connects with the outer world beyond the village were in another part of the village. So there was already that physical, literal exclusion. And I think, I think that's where we need to start when we are, it's easy to say we should include if we want 
to fight for diversity, if we want to maintain our diversity, if we want to enhance our diversity. But we start with the most obvious, glaring, literal uh, uh, fault line that we've had, an old one, which is now being manifested in all kinds of new forms. You know, in the last few days, we've seen uh, the most unlikely people in India uh, uh, sort of uh, taking a stance, an apparently progressive uh, stance, uh, apropos um, uh, Floyd's, um, George Floyd's um, killing, his murder on the basis of race in the United States. But we have to remember that it's very easy to see the need for diversity elsewhere. But to actually practice it at home, to internalize it, to make it part of law, to defend that law, to make it part of institutional practice in educational institutions and um, other, other institutions is, is much more difficult. So I wanted to start with Bama's uh, autobiography where she says, let me, let me give you a feeling of um, the, this beautiful village that she remembers. She says, it extends just up to the bus terminus as if our entire world ended there. So you have multiple um, maps there. You know, those who climb the palms, uh, palm trees, those who sweep streets, those who work leather. Now, the, the sad thing is that a lot of us would like to pretend this is history. This is something of the past, but it's not. It's not. I um, recall when I read from I Have Become the Tide in, um, uh, in various cities uh, in readings last year, I would often have people say that, but you know, all of us grew up in families where they didn't talk about caste. And uh, my response was always, and I too, of course, am very much part of that uh, privileged background. I could only respond with what Bezwada Wilson of the Safai Karamchari Andolan told me once. And he said, well, all of you are lucky because you can be in a situation where you don't talk about caste. We too want to be in such a situation where we need not think about our caste, where we need not be reminded about our caste, where our day-to-day -day experience does not remind us about our caste. And that is, of course, one way to also understand as a rough parallel what is happening right now in the United States. So we talk about caste, but we also from there, when we are talking about, say, Dalit writers and how do we read these uh, texts, we are also looking about, uh, at diversity of language, which is, of course, um, a, a, a terribly important um, component of our multiple cultures, which is multilingualism. It's not just that we have all these languages, but within each language, you have a certain power structure. So you have a standard Telugu, say, or a standard Tamil. Now, since I was talking about Bama, let me, let me go to Tamil. So you have um, a certain literary Tamil. And then when she wrote her autobiography, when Bama wrote her autobiography, uh, the critics said very easily, well, this is not literature because, you know, this is ugly language. And her own community, her own village said, now you have us cursing like this, you have us talking like this already, the upper caste think we are ugly. And now you have confirmed this for them. So actually they wouldn't let her into the village for six months. And the youth in that village, Ambedkarites, had to explain to the people in the village that no, she is actually saying proudly that this is what our lives are like. So not proud that their lives are, are um, uh, miserable, but to say this is the truth, proud to present the truth. So this is the kind of, when we say diversity, we don't just mean paying lip service and saying, you know, showing a, a, a church 
uh, facade and a temple and a, a mosque from outside, which is what I refer to as the Amarad Baranthini model. But to actually learn how to write and read texts which challenge the notion of homogeneity, that there is just one culture in India, there's just one language or one religion, or, you know, that there is a, a majority in terms of cultural practice. There isn't. Because, you know, once you start dividing on the basis of gender and caste and religion and multiple uh, practices on the ground, you have uh, such a variety, such a bewildering variety of even within the same language, you have um, the standard version of Tamil, you have the various um, caste tagged uh, languages, again, which can be used to discriminate. So what do we do with difference? You know, sameness, we seem pretty much equipped in the sense that sameness looks at you, glares at you in the face, that we are all human is pretty obvious, or that we all belong broadly to this place is pretty obvious. And that is, in fact, what literature teaches us, because we are able to read texts or see films or listen to music from different parts of the world, from people whose languages we don't know, who live differently from the way we do on a day to day basis, yet respond to that. So even if you have not intellectualized it, if you have not articulated it, the experience of sameness is quite deep. It is the experience of difference, which is where we need both reason and the imagination. And that really is what we are there to do as readers and writers and as teachers, as students. Now, what, what can we do as not only in, in these identities, but also the unifying identity, which is a citizen. Before the literal virus beat us all down so that we can't see each other face to face, we had a much more frightening virus, a much more shocking virus, given what I began with, which is the constitution, which was the CAA. So to actually challenge our idea of citizenship is taking us away from the real tasks at hand, which is that these constitutional promises have not yet been fulfilled. Because I've just been referring to caste. I, you know, if we have time, I can refer to uh, texts uh, which take on gender, which take on uh, religious community, geographical imbalances, uh, uh, regional uh, uh, discrimination and so on. But rather than resisting, rather than fighting to fulfill those constitutional promises of equality, we in the recent past have actually had direct assaults on our concept of an inclusive citizenship, which is that anybody who lives here, anybody who wants to live in India should be a citizen, regardless of religion or no religion. So we saw last year this assault on the idea of diversity at a very, very fundamental level. And I think that is one part of the narrative, but I really want to round it off with the most important part of the narrative, because every generation we are going to see problems, we're going to see challenges, we're going to see assaults, we're going to see literal as well as metaphorical viruses. So what I really want to emphasize is on the one hand, you have texts being written, read, taught that actually challenge 
these assaults on diversity, these assaults on reason, but you also have, and this is very important for us cultural practitioners, for those of us who partake of culture, this is very important to see that there are new forms of cultural practice, new forms of art, because art needn't always be seen with an exclusive capital A, but an inclusive popular form of expression. We've seen on the streets, we've seen graffiti, we've seen art on the walls, on the roads in Shaheen Bagh. We've seen music across the country that uses a variety of traditions that innovates on the basis of that, that includes people, that includes issues and movements. And that is where I want to end, that the best way perhaps for you and me to fight for our diversity and say it's important to embrace difference, this is what makes life rich, this is what makes us human, this is what makes us curious, to learn about the other, to learn about difference. The important thing is to say that we will live a life of solidarity. We will celebrate difference and we will refuse to be homogenized. Thank you. I'd be very happy to take questions. Uh Thank you for what is definitely a very thought-provoking um, lecture. And now is the time for questions. I believe questions are already being sent to the number that is being scrolled towards the bottom of the screen. And I'm handing the microphone over now to Tonmoy, Professor Tonmoy Kundu, head of the Department of English, Midnapur College. He will be reading out the questions and then uh, Iran will respond. Tonmoy. Thank you so much, Aikat. It's my pleasure, ma'am. I think we've lost you, Tanmoy. The Tanmoy is your microphone muted. Okay, now. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay, ma so as uh, ma'am, I said that I we will take questions from the comment box, or uh, if they send the comment or observation or questions to you, uh, to the WhatsApp number. So uh, some of you, uh, some questions I'm reading out. Uh, there is a scholar, uh, uh, PhD scholar at uh, Kaji Nazrul University, Gaurav Shina. He has asked how freedom to offend, as Salman Rushdie very often points out is related to freedom of speech. So how freedom to offend, as Salman Rushdie very often points out, it is related to freedom of speech. So what's your uh, view okay. on that? Yeah, let's let's um, let's leave uh, Salman Rushdie out of it. I think, uh, oh. you know, we we live uh, in India and uh, uh, let's talk about it in our uh, context. Okay, there are, there are multiple answers here. This is, this is a complex question. Uh, of course, theoretically, for uh, as far as readers and writers go, uh, the South African uh, writer Andre Brink said that writers are more important, not less important in times of siege. And that really the, um, uh, not just the writer, but all cultural practitioners are supposed to be theoretically on the margins of society, willing to offend, not uh, in a narrow literal sense, but willing to disturb the status quo by asking questions. That really is the meaning of dissent, to ask questions to introduce doubt and to insist on debate. That is actually the job of the writer. I would say the job of all education. So not just to provide information, and these days, you know, uh, <laughs> information is just there all around you, but it is to teach you to go out there and say, how do I ask questions? How do I look critically at what is being offered to me? And then how do I link various fragments and create 
a particular framework. Because a couple of ideas by themselves, everybody has it. That is how people pay lip service. But how do you link that into a framework of values, uh, an ideological framework, a constitutional framework? So the right to offend is not some sort of childish, entitled sort of, um, you know, I, I, I will do, I will say whatever I want, wherever, and so on. It is fundamentally the right to dissent. You might think that men, women should not be on the streets. They should not be in the metro in the middle of the night. And you, you take offense because I am on the metro. Now, that is the right to offend. Because it is, it is entangled with your right to equality. Those earlier rights we spoke of, whatever in terms of expression, self-expression, is entangled with those constitutional rights we spoke of, is the right to offend. But the right to offend is a small part of the right to free speech. So I wouldn't foreground it. Yes. So uh, another question uh, put by Sek Tari Kali, uh, are the roadside graffitis and revolutionary art against the dra draconian art minor literature? Are the roadside graffitis and revolutionary art against the draconian act minor literature? Just the last two words I didn't catch, I'm sorry. Draconian act minor literature. Uh... It's a, I'm not, yeah. I'm not terribly sure of the question, but you know, what, what is art is, is something that develops over a period of time. So uh, we have certain sort of uh, artificial binaries, the classical, you know, high culture, popular culture, and so on. Again, it's actually a question of diversity. Uh, you know, uh, our lives as human beings, uh, let me be a little uh, flippant here. Uh, if you ate only dal chawal, you might be virtuous, but your life would be very boring, you know. So once in a while, you're going to eat some chips or so, you know, something which is not very good for you, but it makes life, you know, um, much more entertaining. Similarly, you have to have a variety, a variety, a diversity of cultural experiences in your life. You can have the, the simple drum beat, which everybody identifies it with. You can have the much more classical proscenium. Now, you know, of course, that Shakespeare's plays were at one time very much what we would describe as popular culture. And it was over a period of time that for various reasons, it got mainstreamed and then it became classical and then various generations of students were tortured with uh, studying it in college. Uh, and because it was very different and very far from their lives in terms of language, as well as everything else, the setting and so on, then it became something classical. So who are we to say that the art and the music that we see today, the videos we see today, the new poetry we hear today is not the new art. So art forms, practices, we should always be open to it because um, uh, uh, film, for example, is not very old. Television is even newer. This, this new technology we're using. So it's like the technology. You have new forms and these actually, not only are they telling us that forms of culture, practices will extend, will change, but they're also telling us 
that this is what is cutting edge. This is how we are resisting. And you always pay attention to those who experiment, those who take risks. Whether they succeed or not in terms of art, whether they succeed or not in terms of politics, the risk takers are always the ones to follow. Okay, ma'am. So, ma'am, uh, another question put by uh, Ravi Halder. Uh, yes. Ravi Halder, he is a student of English literature uh, in uh, Ravindwarati University, Kolkata. So, mm. uh, he has, she has, uh, uh, he has the put the question: How look? How you look at the scenario where there is a large amount of citizen are in the road protesting on the death of George Floyd? On the other hand, few young people playing by the challenging each other on social media, the act of killing George by kneeling him down. So how you look at the scenario? Well, I'm not, uh, I can only offer my own opinion for what it's worth. Two things I want to say. One is uh, that, you know, the race question, it's, it's, it's been there forever in the United States. The uh, United States was founded first on uh, genocide of the Native Americans and then on slavery. So this, it's sort of like our uh, caste. Uh, we say that uh, the law uh, forbids um, casteism uh the law forbids racism uh there is um positive affirmation there we have res reservation here and so on but it is well and alive and there is one point which should be of particular interest to us here in india which is that when in alleged times of peace and i'm saying alleged and I want to underline that. It's easy to sort of sweep day-to-day -day racism as well as day-to-day -day casteism under, under the cup. But in times of crisis such as now with COVID-19, you have, you know, uh, who, who are at the receiving end? In fact, even in terms of the number of uh, victims of COVID-19, uh, there is a disproportionately larger number of African-Americans or Hispanic Americans getting COVID-19 because I suppose of the conditions they live in because of immunity, nutrition. And this is of interest to us. There's a kind of certain boiling point beyond which people will not tolerate it. And our interest in a way is not just, of course, to look at America, but also to see the counterpart here. Let's not forget that these workers who we are calling migrants as if they're going to be perpetual perennial outsiders, they've been invisible. Where did they come from? You know, at least in 2018, um, we had all those spectacular uh, farmer marches and suddenly everybody the middle class all of us woke up and said oh my god oh the farmers are there but who are these the workers this country is rests on their shoulders they provide all the services all the work they build and hold the edifice on which we stand so there is a very sharp counterpart here. And I think that is what we have to force ourselves while we are looking at what is happening with George Floyd with horror. We have to force our view right back to what is happening here. Just the fact that some of those trains took them home, quote unquote, there is no home for them anymore either there or here. So I think that in, in times of crisis such as the present, not just the virus, but the huge economic crisis, which actually 
lays bare the terrible, terrible cracks, systemic cracks that we live with. I think this is the time to look at that. That is, so gestures are all very well. People kneeling there or people, you know, uh, we will all do what we can, uh, making rotis and, you know, uh, taking it to the trains and so on. That is what human beings do on a day-to-day -day basis. But really what we need to do is use this opportunity to insist that the system must change. Something fundamental must change. Okay. Ma'am, uh, there is another question that you talked about the Omar Akhman Antony model. So do you think in the present scenario, these models still persist damages this head mongering and religious persecution? I'm sorry, you have to be a little clearer. You know, I'm I'm getting old and yeah, a little bit. Mm. Yeah, so you talked about Omar Akhman Antony model. So do you think in the present scenario, this model still persists amidst this headmongering and religious persecution? Yeah, you know, the uh, irony of uh, talking about Amar Akbar Anthony is that we were at one time critical of it, and we still are, in the sense that it's a, it's a kind of, you know, bland, official, okay, everyone will live um, together in harmony, but they will not really live together. They will have their separate sort of, you know, segregated but uh, legally equal kind of model okay so we were hoping that with the constitution with already even if it's bland but this official narrative of diversity this official recognition of diversity that we would move forward to a much more inclusive, not just equal, separate, not fighting with each other, but all in their separate places. Mm? That there would be much more inclusion, that they would come together as equal citizens. Mm? But even before we could, you know, continue with this real battle, what has happened? We've lost even that bland official narrative. We've lost even Amar Akbar Anthony saying, okay, you be safe in that side of the road and I'll be safe on this side. Even that is gone. So we live in times where old inadequacies in our society have split wide open and they have become active evil dividing, polarizing, violent. Dividers of human society. So this is what we saw in uh, Delhi. We have any number of examples. This is what we now feel is always below the surface, that it can explode at any time. And I don't think we have heard the kind of um, violent public discourse, shamelessly, brazenly violent discourse, as we have heard in the last year or two, ever. In my life, I can't remember hearing any such thing in public space by people who apparently hold some position of power, official position, and so on. So that is where we are. So our task is set for us. But let me quickly again add, because there's just no point only feeling sorry for ourselves and being gloomy and being brokenhearted. That we are because we are human. How do we take it forward? How do we actually make use of it? Because what's the use of just sitting and weeping? We follow the examples of our frontline workers, as we're saying with COVID, but the long metaphorical COVID we've been living with, we follow our frontline workers, young people who've been so brave, people who've spoken up at considerable risk to themselves, 
And again, here too, we follow the principle of diversity, that we don't allow only one sort of person to talk, but we have a range of voices because as different constituencies, we have a range of concerns. So whether it's women, whether it's the caste movements, whether it's a, a progressive, non-religious movements, all of them, we have to listen to. So, ma'am, uh, uh, it's a question from uh, Shambhagji. Uh, she has uh, just uh, uh, said, uh, it's a pleasure listening to you, ma'am. And then he, she has put the question, like the language of Shakespeare came while answering a question, I would like to know how do you see language, not only for producing literature, but also in social terms. So do you think that the, be it solidarity, be it social and cultural exchanges, be it gender, language can play an important part. And yes, by yes, that, you, yeah, so, by sorry. That, yeah, CSR again. Uh, by that I mean, do you think language reformations can help changing social scenarios in any way? This is, uh, you know, this is very close uh, to the question of wondering whether um, yeah. Uh, let, me, let me separate uh, language into uh, two artificial streams. One is uh, language as used by uh, writers. Um, writers, I, I doubt very much, much as we would like to, I don't think uh, our writing, our language or ideas can actually change the world. But what it can do is take you to that first step I spoke of, which is to remind you that you're human, to rehumanize those who have been dehumanized by allowing you to imagine what it's like to be somebody else. That's what literature does. That's the task of language in one particular way. Okay? Then, of course, I'm not going to touch the other area, which is the politics of different languages. Uh, what is the language of power? Uh, how does that work and so on? Let's leave that aside because that's a whole uh, different jungle. But you're talking about um, changes in the use of day-to-day -day language. Yes, I think, I think, again, these are very important gestures and practices. But again, they are only gestures and practices. They're terribly important. It's, uh, you know, for example, if, you're, uh, if you say chairperson instead of uh, chairman, you know, and some much more important examples than that, that is an indication that we are entering into some sort of contract through day-to-day -day usage of language that, okay, here's a signpost. You may not have internalized it. Just because you say chairperson doesn't mean that everybody on the panel thinks that uh, the women on the panel have something to say which is as valuable as the men on the panel. Okay? But it is the first step. So it is language changes in usage reflect certain ideas that are floating around in society which may or may not have been internalized by a sufficient number of people for it to create a certain change. But it's a gesture. That's, that's all. That's all it is. Okay, ma'am. So, ma'am, uh, there's uh, another question put by uh, Dr. Antara Mukherjee. So, uh, she has uh, stated that uh, she organized three-day event uh, in their college called a Calcutta, uh, event named uh, Cal Calcutta 23, celebrating diversity, to celebrate the diversity of neighborhood of pin code call 23 in November last year. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, uh, they organized a, an event there. Uh, Dr. Antara Mukherjee from Government Girls General Degree College, Kolkata. She organized a three-day event in the mm -hmm. college. Uh, called Kolkata 23, celebrating diversity 
to celebrate the diversity of the neighborhood a pin code call 23 in the last okay. uh, normal last year okay so she has asked a question in our bid to celebrate diversity are we not gaining a different ground of reliving or excavating what has remained buried for ages and thereby educating the younger generation particularly in case of oral art forms like dastongi dastangoi dastangoi mm. ah. mm. i'm not sure i've understood the question though so it's a very uh, long and <laughs> yeah yeah so i'm uh, uh, reading it again uh, in our bid uh, to celebrate diversity are we not gaining a different ground of reliving and or excavating what has remained buried for ages and thereby educating the younger generation particularly in case of oral art forms like dastangui yes yes um uh you know the uh, various art forms and uh, oral or uh, whatever you want to call it traditional or folk quote unquote all those have been around forever they've all been there it's uh, uh, you know when we have experiments whether in uh, uh, music even film music which has appropriated uh, you know so much of uh, uh, the uh, traditional uh, music from uh, Rajasthan or uh, elsewhere now all those experiments experiment is a very important part of cultural practice you know um, after all we are very lucky because i i as a novelist i feel i'm very lucky i live in times where the novel as a form um, is a, a large spacious mansion in which i can do all kinds of things i can put poetry into it i can put recipes into it i can you know so the form itself admits of all kinds of innovations so similarly the uh, admitting that this country would not hold together without not only our acknowledgement of diversity but our active um uh, uh, you know uh, wooing of diversity our active inclusion on the basis of diversity of all kinds of people first and all kinds of cultural practices uh, in reference to your question it's it's a question of how do you make those forms meaningful for our times so because if you don't then it becomes a a a kind of what shall i say an ethnographic uh um, remedy of you know you say oh this um, language is dying or this art form is dying and you put it in a museum so people can go and look at it and admire it and say oh they used to do this that is the, the the museum of course you know is 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 a, a, a kind of valuable uh, part of our lives but it's a part really for an art form for us to respond to it for it to resonate to us in the times we live in we have to create a vivid link a connect between that form whether it is the sangoi or some other form of dance or whatever with our lives today and that is where of course um experiment comes in so first we admire the sangoi for itself then somebody says oh i'm going to use it to um, perform um, certain tales which show how clever old women are so uh, we did and that as uh, uh, folk tales for example so then there is a particular connect so finally that is that is how you um, resuscitate old and traditional art forms you connect them again to the kind of people we are today shall we have just one more question yes ma'am uh, uh, there are a lot of questions i am getting so uh, uh, one questions are from a student uh, now pursuing uh, ma in our college so what's your views on implementing hindi as a common language for all indians 
Will it be able to eliminate language barriers or is it violating the fundamental values? Uh, it's from Chandika Dandapath, our students of PG fourth semester, ma'am. So, well, I think I think uh, uh, the word imposing. <laughs> <laughs> Anything yes. which begins with the word imposing, you know that the rest of the sentence <laughs> should be thrown out of the window. Um, so uh, there's absolutely no question of um, imposing uh, any language. And that is exactly what I was talking about. Um, you know, once you start imposing a language, you start imposing a religion. And that's exactly uh, what we are fighting right now. Um, as for language, I think for India to be anything but multilingual will not be India. It will not be the place we know and it will be impossible. So I think um, there's no point even considering it. I think what the danger that we need to consider is to again add another layer of power politics to language uh, we are always going to have you can look you can either see our multilingual situation as a huge problem or you can see it as a challenge with great rewards if you are going to see it as a huge problem you're going to say you're going to exaggerate the need for a link language as if we have not survived all these years with multiple languages hmm? Uh, if you look at it as a huge challenge with all kinds of rewards, the challenge, of course, is to include, how do you include translation, which is the solution that we had in, um, the, the, in medieval India in the 14th, 15th century. There was, there was widespread um, uh, translation from one language to the other. You also had in uh, border uh, countries, you have, um, you know, uh, border areas, you have languages which actually are um, a, a mix of each other. You know, so it's not as if languages are geographically contained, that languages no borders. So this is, you. how do you, how would you map, uh, where would you put Urdu, for example? Or you have, you know, I come from uh, Palakkad, yeah, and we speak a, a strange and hybrid mixture of Malayalam and Tamil. Now, this is, this is uh, uh, you know, so you have to have certain principles there of hybridity being okay, that uh, because, you know, Hindi in Bombay, for example, which is the Hindi I learned, uh, and when I moved to Delhi, discovered it, uh, nobody considered it Hindi. So what do you do with hybridity? with uh but people will find a way language like life will find a way which is why we have so many mixes which have now become pan-indian where hindi words have entered other languages where you know tamil words gujarati words marathi words we've all it's all got mixed up so there is absolutely no question of imposing any language you have to have multiple official languages in so far as you need official languages. You have to introduce translation as an important and essential part of education. Because that is the only way we're going to be able to speak to each other and then make use of those riches, which is what we get in each other's languages to be able to read literature in each other's languages, to be able to uh, see theater in each other's languages, films in each other's languages. So in a way, the translator is a very, very, very important figure in our country. Thank you. Ma'am, uh, actually, if you allow, uh, I, I would like to take one more question. And that is also my, uh, my uh, thought also. And, oh, uh, th that yes. would be the last question. Okay. So it's from uh, Daisi Mojumdar from Jhargram Raj College. Uh, as a professor or scholars, how important is our role to preserve diversity in our country and cultures and to nurture a culture of dignity for all? 
what can we practically do for our students and in our classrooms? I'm so, so glad that uh, uh, this question came up and that it's the last question. I think it's appropriate um, yes. coming from uh, uh, a, un a university, a college setting. I think we should really seriously think about what we are doing when we are teaching in a classroom, when we are learning in a classroom, when we are writing a textbook, when we're doing a research paper, or when writers like me go and speak at a university. I think our job is actually to talk about education, meaning inclusion, ideas that come in there. What happens when you have a low, whole lot of ideas and viewpoints? You start asking questions. You start developing your critical faculty. It becomes easier then when even if you've grown up in a certain context with a whole lot of prejudices, with a whole lot of stereotypes, because you know how to ask questions, because you know how to draw your own conclusions on the basis of this openness of mind, this willingness to say, maybe I heard wrong, to allow doubt to come into your head, to allow confusion to come into your head so that you seek clarity and your own answers. I think that is the meaning of education and that is the strongest armor we have against hate mongering, against the further building of stereotypes, against the inculcation of prejudice. And let's not forget that the two principal settings of infection when it comes to prejudice is the home and the classroom. So those teachers in school are really important. Now, the whole idea of going from home to school to college is actually to literally widen your view of the world, which also means widening that view in your head, in terms of ideas, in terms of the ability to introduce doubt, in terms of the ability to debate, and then come to your own conclusions. And then of course, find out who you can work in solidarity with. And I think that that is, uh, you know, because the individual can do only so much. So that's the note I want to end on, which is that whether you're a teacher or a student or even an isolated writer, finally, your individual ideas, your individual questions are important, but can only do so much. You have to move towards the collective. You have to move towards solidarity. You have to move towards alliances. And finally, if you can, you have to be part of movements. Thank you. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, so, ma'am, uh, we are actually getting a lot of questions. I don't. Uh, I know that uh, they will have uh, the questions will be there. So we have to think about the time and time constraint. So thank you, ma'am. Uh, over to Shaykhoda. Yeah, it has been again a very engaging session with uh, lots of questions that are being asked. I wanted to ask something myself, but maybe at a later time I can do that. Um, um, we are almost towards the end of our session, and we have just a formal vote of thanks to be offered by one of our students, Sushmita Chatterjee of PG Second Semester. Today is also her birthday, so let me wish her a happy birthday. And Sushmita, are you here? Yes, sir, I'm here. Okay. Hello, sir. Uh, yeah. Happy birthday, Sushmita. <laughs> Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, so over to you. You offer your vote of thanks and then we'll call it a day. Yes, ma'am. A very good afternoon to you. I am really blessed to hear such words from you. Thank you so much for your vibrant presentation. It is indeed great to hear your valuable words. You are indeed the torch bearer for the future generation. Whatever I will say, will be less to define your capability and contribution towards our society in forming the basic views, modern contemporary views towards it, whether it is the work 
the thousand faces of night where the struggle for the survival and freedom for women and individuality stands supreme or the work i have become the tide where it encapsulates not only india but the world we live in today complement one another in a more vibrant way your spontaneous positive vibes will always guide us towards a broader and better thinking capability so to make world more refined and defined platform to live in thank you so much ma'am for sharing such views and for taking such precious time and uh, to communicate with us thank you so much thank you and i'll answer all those other questions another time thank you so much